I have always been uh, envious of people who can be fluent in more than one language. Always admired those kinds of people. In the course of my studies, I have taken in school at least Latin, German, Greek, and Hebrew. And I am fluent in none of them. None. Given enough time, I can construct a couple of good sentences in German, but I certainly am not conversational. Back in 1989, Pat and I took a trip <clears throat> to uh, Europe in which we vis visited places like Germany and Poland and the Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union and Finland and Sweden and Denmark. Three weeks on the same bus with the same people, and it was wonderful. <laughs> the uh, woman guide was a young woman from Albania. And the bus driver who was with us the whole time was from Belgium. And they had learned, because they had been together before, that the language they had the most vocabulary for and the most ease of communicating was Italian. And so to converse with each other, it was always Italian. She always talked to us in English. I don't know what the bus driver talked to because he didn't talk much. <laughs> what a gift it is to be able to communicate with people who are different from you. People who grew up in different places, have different histories and different stories. <coughs> On this Pentecost Sunday, as the story is told, being able to understand was critically important. I've always uh, kind of pictured that first Pentecost, uh, people from all over the world who had gathered into Jerusalem for Pentecost, which then was a uh, a Jewish festival, one of, of importance, and that no matter where they had come from, for they were world citizens, they were able to understand each other. No matter what language had been their native language, somehow in that language, they began to hear the stories of God's intervention in human history in Jesus of Nazareth. There were no barriers, apparently, they were all in that together, the former differences and distinctions which often trap us into our tribal groups was gone. The story of Pentecost, I think, is the polar opposite to the Hebrew story of the Tower of Babel. This strange little story in the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis provides some rationale for the reason for there being so many languages in this world of ours. The story says that the people were all of the same language at one time and they decided that they would build this tower into the sky. It would be a testimony of their power and their cleverness. If in fact God is up there, they would build that tower high enough. They could look God right in the eye and say, I'm as good as you are, God. I may be human, but I am as good as you are, God. And God in the story doesn't like that, so God confuses their languages, scatters them all over the world as if God would be threatened by human accomplishments. So the story says that's why there's all these languages in the world. If the Tower of Babel is chapter 1, then we can see Pentecost as being chapter 2. For here, instead of emphasizing their differences, the ways in which people are competitive, the aspects that keep us separated in our tribal groups, God is seeking to gather the people of Earth together. God is present as the Holy Spirit, to dramatically change the given order, the way things always have been. This cosmopolitan gathering of people from all over the world, 
begin to hear something of God's intervention in human history in this Jesus person. And the message of God is to be one that overcomes all, all barriers as they try to understand what has happened in their world. The impediments that usually kept, keep us apart, the suspicions that we usually have of the other, the other being anybody but ourselves, are overcome by the ability to hear and to relate and to understand. Instead of being identified primarily by our place of birth, by the language we speak, by our ethnic identity and our customs, we, in fact, all of us, are all part of one family, and it's all God's family. And the people are amazed. They're perplexed, they're bewildered, dumbfounded, struggling to make sense of how is this possible? Because the world is so divided. And on this occasion, we seem to be so together. But there were others, there always are scoffers, of course, and they do not understand what they have just experienced does not fit with their opinions of what is reality. And so they dismiss the whole event by saying, they are just filled with new wine. They're drunk. They don't know any better. Perhaps most of us have experienced someone who has had too much to drink, too much alcohol to drink. It's usually not a pretty sight. My own family has known the disease of alcoholism a person of promise limited by this disease. So being filled with new wine is not always an admirable state of being. In Jesus' day, wine was a very customary drink, usually in moderation. That wine, alcohol, was not used to produce altered states of consciousness. It was not used to impress fraternity members, to get along with the crowd, to testify to your entrance into adulthood. But wine was the daily beverage in a society without refrigeration, something that would keep. Interestingly, Jesus talked about the expansive qualities of new wine, fresh wine, in the process of becoming better wine. This comes from Matthew's Gospel. Jesus said, neither is new wine put into old wine skins, otherwise the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins and so both are preserved. On Pentecost, that first Pentecost, those first followers of the Jesus way were so transformed, so changed, that some thought that they were under the influence of this new wine, that they were drunk. So that the caution of Jesus is important, that new wine requires new containers. That new Christians, if they are filled with the Holy Spirit, will need to make room for this transformation. So that if you want to walk the Jesus walk, if you want to take seriously Jesus' teachings, it cannot be a, just an add-on to business as usual. Pentecost Christians, if that's what we want to become, Pentecost Christians are those who are willing to be changed. Pentecost Christians are willing to put on the new reimagining themselves as now being a different person. New Christians jump into the water. They get immersed. In a sense, allowing the baptismal water of whatever happened back then to continue the transformation of our lives 
as we would seek to be more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Someone has said this. <clears throat> Sitting in church will not make a person a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage will make a person a car. Sitting in church will not make a person a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage will make a person a car. Pentecost Christians understand the new wine will need room to grow, to expand, change. Meaning that the Jesus path is the path of adventure, that every time you think you've got it figured out, that you've got God figured out, that you've got God's ways figured out, that you've got yourself figured out, that you know what God wants you to do absolutely, <clears throat> be prepared to have your apple cart upended. The new wine will seek new ways to express itself. The new you, if you want to, become the new you, will not easily fit into the old you, be prepared. Pentecost Christians wear red on Pentecost, the flame of the Spirit of God, because it is alive, it is, it is, it is wild, it's uncontrollable, it is rich in possibilities. Which means that no matter what you now believe about God, no matter what you now believe about Jesus of Nazareth, or no matter what you now believe about the Holy Spirit, you need to make room for revisions. God's not through with you. Ideas of God are not placed in jars, put on a shelf, sealed, dated, stored, for however long we live. We always need to have a growing edge regarding God as long as we are able to ponder important things. That being filled with new wine means our understanding of God is open-ended. Never a period. Never saying, I've got it all figured out, the hard work is done. Eat, sleep, and rest. Every statement a faith we can boldly make needs to end with a comma. Even the new creed which we read before, it ought to end with a comma. For commas signify that something else is coming. That a new formation is always out there a little bit beyond us, waiting for the right time, the right place, to nudge into rethinking our theology, rethinking our way of viewing the world and its people making room for God to reveal more of God's self. We usually think of Christian education programs as being geared toward young people and children. That somehow by the age of 15 or 20, we're finished. We know it all. It's all on the shelf, packaged, got it all figured out. We don't need to go to school anymore. Christian education for children, yes. Young people, yes. People in midlife, yes. People in retirement, yes. We are all prime candidates to be changed, to be transformed by the new wine of God's spirit, God's continuing gift of renewal. This world, you and me. The fruit of the vine, which we will share at the table today, is a symbol of this new wine, this wild wine, this drink of exceptional importance. Sharing these elements of Holy Communion has in the past strengthened and sustained people who lived here before us. And we are in their train, in their procession with them. 
It provided hope and comfort and confirmation for them who have gone before us, and it will do the same for us. For our destiny is to become potential saints in the making, thereby dispensers of God's gifts to others. So be filled with the new wine of new life, of new possibilities. Be a surprise for the people you live with. May they ponder, be amazed by our willingness to love and forgive and lead joyful lives of hope and promise. May they shake their heads and say, what in the world have they been drinking? God's gift. Amen.